Okay. Okay. Ready? All right, my name is Emma Scholl, and I'm a staff attorney at Legal Aid Society in Nashville. And my colleague Russ and I today are going to be talking about Medicare. And historically, our program hasn't really seen a lot of Medicare cases, but it is very important to have a general understanding of Medicare, especially when you're working with clients who may be losing TenCare coverage, so you can advise them about when their Medicare will kick in. So there are four parts to Medicare. I will be covering parts A and B, and then Russ will be covering parts C and D. Um, part A is hospital coverage, part B is medical coverage, part C is Medicare Advantage plans, and part D is prescription drug plans. So for part, in a, for part A and B, what I'm going to be talking about first is eligibility, premiums for these parts, and I'm going to talk about Medicare Savings Program, enrollments in part A and B, penalties for late enrollment, and what is covered under Medicare Part A and B. So to start, um, in order to be eligible for Medicare Part A and B, you either have to be a U.S. citizen or you have to be a lawful permanent resident that has resided in the U.S. for five continuous years. And once you meet those two threshold requirements, there are a couple categories of people who are eligible for Medicare. The first one is if you turn age 65. Second is if you are under 65, but you've been receiving Social Security Disability, SSDI, for 24 months. Um, if you're under 65 and receive SSDI due to ALS. If you're under 65 and have end-stage renal disease. And there are um, a lot of special rules um, concerning end-stage renal disease and Medicare that we don't have time to cover today. But just as a preliminary matter, if you're working with someone who has um, some kidney issues and they talk about renal failure, just be on alert that they could be eligible for Medicare. And then um, lastly, if there is a disabled child over 20 that has received SSDI for 24 months, developed a disability before age 22, has, and has one parent that receives Social Security retirement and is unmarried. This per person can be eligible for Medicare. And this is um, what we commonly refer to as adult, ad a dis disabled adult child benefits, or DAC. So to start with Medicare Part A, um, if a person or the person's spouse, which can be living, deceased, or divorced, has 40 quarters of work history, a person does not have to pay a premium for Medicare Part A. And for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar with Social Security, a quarter of work history generally translates to three months. Um, in 2018, in order to get a quarter, you had to earn $1,320 over that three month period. Um, there is a max of four quarters per year. So what we're talking about generally is about 10 years of work history. But of course, there are some situations may, where you may be working and then you've stopped and you didn't gain those quarters. But in general, it's going to be about 10 years. Also for um, the marriage, it also has to be over 10 years. So if you were married to someone, got divorced, if the marriage lasted 10 years or over, you can draw off that person's um, benefits and be eligible for Medicare through their account. So if those things are true for you, you do not have to pay a premium for Part A. However, if you have between 30 and 39 work quarters, your Medicare Part A premium will be $232 per month. And if you have 30 or less work quarters, your Medicare Part A premium will be $422 per month. So it can be very expensive if you have not paid in those quarters to the system. For Medicare Part B, everyone has to pay a premium, and it doesn't matter how many work quarters you have. So in 2018, most people's Medicare Part B premium is going to be $134 per month. Um, this depends on your tax earnings, um, but for most of our clients, it's going to be $134. Um, 
If your income is below a certain amount, TenCare will pay your Medicare Part A or B premium for you. And this is called a Medicare Savings Program. There are four types of Medicare Savings Programs. They are QMB, SLMB, QI, and QDWI. To start with QMB, um, your income has to be below this um, 1032 a month and the resources below that amount. It's a higher amount if you are in a couple. And the QMB program covers your Medicare Part A premium, Medicare Part B premium, and coinsurance and deductible amounts for services under Part A and B. And so this can be pretty significant because um, in 2018, the Medicare Part A um, deductible is $1,340 and the Medicare Part B deductible is $183 per year. And if you did not have QMB, um, you would typically have to pay about 20% of coinsurance costs for doctor visits, therapy visits, things like that. But if you have QMB, that 20% is covered. So for your clients who have um, income and resources below this amount, QMB is a great way for them to pay their medical costs. For SLMB, um, the income amounts are listed here along the resources. And the SLMB program only pays for the Medicare Part B premium. So this will pay for that $134 premium each month. Um, normally, if you're not on a Medicare savings program, that amount would just be deducted out of your Social Security disability benefits. For the QI program, the income and resource limits are listed above, and this also just pays for your Medicare Part B premium. Um, so again, um, that will pay for the 134 premium under Part B. For the Qualified Disabled and Working Individual, um, this is a program for people who are under 65 disabled according to the Social Security rules, but continue to work and are not otherwise eligible for Medicare. Um, they do have a higher income threshold because they are working. Um, and this program pays for a person's Medicare Part A premium. This program is pretty rare. I've never run into a client who is on this, but just be aware of it. So next, when can you enroll in Medicare Part A and B? So if a person qualifies for Medicare because they're getting SSDI, they have to wait 24 months, and on the 25th month of receipt, they will be automatically enrolled into Medicare. So they do not have to apply for Medicare. Their enrollment will be automatic. If a person qualifies for Medicare because she has ALS, she will also be automatically enrolled, but in her first month of SSI, SSDI receipt. Um, so this person does not have to wait the two year waiting period. If a person qualifies for Medicare because he has end stage renal disease, um, that person will be enrolled when he provides the required documentation to the Social Security office. This is either about dialysis or kidney transplant status. If a person is eligible for Medicare because that person is turning 65, the initial enrollment period to sign up for A and B <laughs> begins three months before he or she turns 65 and ends three months after he or she turns 65. So it's a, in total, it's a seven month period. So I just gave an example about Alice. She'll turn 65 in August. Her initial enrollment period starts in May and ends in November. And if you're entitled to premium free Medicare Part A, which means that you paid in your work quarters, um, you have sufficient work history or your spouse does, you can enroll in Medicare Part A at any time. Um, if you sign up for Medicare A or B during the first three months of the initial enrollment period, your coverage will start on the first day of the month you turn 65, unless your birthday is on the first day of the month, and then your coverage will start on the first 
day of the previous month. Um, and the little chart talks about if you are not entitled to premium free Medicare Part A and B, when your coverage will start. Is it 65 for everybody or is that that's, um, What do you mean is it? When you can start getting your Medicare. Everybody needs 65 or yes, everybody? it just depends on whether or not you have to pay a premium for your part A. So if you are eligible for premium free Medicare part A. So again, if you have all your quarters, you can sign up at any time after your initial enrollment without penalty. And if you sign up, um, your coverage will start six months retroactively from when you're enrolled, as long as the state is not before you are entitled to Medicare. Um, so as an example, Alice is eligible for a premium free Medicare Part A in June 2016. She does not sign up until June 2017, but she's not going to have a penalty because she is eligible for premium free Medicare and her Medicare part will start in December 2016. So that's counting back six months before she enrolled. If you are eligible for a special enrollment period, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and you enroll during that period, your coverage will start the month after you enroll or apply. So if you are not eligible for premium free Medicare Part A and you miss the in initial enrollment period, you will be subject to a penalty unless you meet the criteria for a special enrollment period. And the penalty is 10% of your premium and lasts for twice the number of years you are eligible for Medicare Part A but didn't sign up. So the example I give here, um, again with Alice, she is not eligible for premium free Medicare Part A because she only has 38 quarters of work. She turned 65 in June 2016. She didn't sign up for Medicare Part A and then she waits two years to sign up. If she had signed up when she was 65, her premium would have been 232 per month but now she'll need to pay a penalty of $23.20 every month for four years. And so over a four year period, she is stuck with a $1,113.60 penalty because she did not sign up during the initial enrollment period. If you miss your enrollment for part B, you will be subject to a penalty unless you meet the criteria for a special enrollment period. And for Part B, the penalty starts um, at 10% of your premium and increases by 10% for every full month period. You could have had Medicare Part B, but you did not enroll. And the penalty lasts for as long as you have Medicare Part B. So this can be pretty serious. Um, so again with Alice, she turned 65 in June. She doesn't enroll in Medicare Part B until August 2018. Um, her Medicare premium would have been 134. She is now subject to a 20% penalty because two full 12 month periods passed before she signed up and her penalty will be $160.80. Per month? Yes, that's per month. Um, if you, now we're going to talk about special enrollment periods. So if you don't sign up for Medicare Part A or B during the initial enrollment period, you won't be facing a penalty if you enroll, if you're eligible to enroll later in a special enrollment period or an SEP. And you are enrolled, you're entitled to an SEP if you, your spouse, or family member if disabled, is working and covered by a group health plan through that employer. Another um, thing that entitles you to a special enrollment period is a Medicare savings program. And special enrollment period is eight months and it begins the month after employment ends or the month after your group health plan ends. And that's whatever happens first. So an example of this would be, um, let's say Alice is 68. She is still working at legal aid, but she's going to retire in July. And she has um, group 
plan insurance through legal aid. So she did not sign up for Medicare Part B because she didn't want to have to pay her premium for her legal aid health insurance and a premium for Medicare Part B. So her employment and her health insurance are going to end in July when she retires. So her eight months to enroll in the special enrollment period will begin in August um, after because her health insurance and her employment ended in July. And that period will go August through March. And she will not be subject to a penalty because she's eligible for the special enrollment period. So if you are not, if you missed your initial enrollment period and you're not eligible for a special enrollment period, you have to enroll in the general enrollment period, which is between January 1st and March 31st of each year. And if you enroll during that general enrollment period, your coverage will start on July 1st of that year. Okay, so how Medicare Part A and B work together. If you are entitled to premium free Medicare Part A, you can choose to get A and B at the same time, enroll in A when you turn 65 and delay enrollment in B or only enroll in A. And so the most common situation is if someone is 65 and they're still working and they're entitled to premium free Medicare Part A, um, they usually will en enroll in Part A right when they turn 65 because it doesn't cost anything. And so they might as well enroll, but then they will delay their Medicare Part B enrollment because if they have health insurance through their employer, they're probably already paying a premium and don't wanna pay with two premiums. Um, and with Medicare Part B, you have to pay the premium whether or not you're using it. And it's also important to know if you have um, in coverage through your employer and you have Medicare Part A, your um, insurance through your employer will pay first and then Medicare is the second payer. Hey, Emma. Yes, so Teresa have, Bay. I've had um, doctors ask me for veterans is where I have to come up. Mm -hmm. if, if they won't take the client if they have veterans. And sometimes they say the veterans will take it. Medicare should go for the veterans. Then. And so they're just a little picky about yeah. TRICARE. Yeah. So I, just, I never heard that. We've all got the patient, TRICARE, TRICARE, and we'll take it to Yeah. I'm not really sure about how TRICARE fits into this. Do you know, Russ? No. Okay. <laughs> we don't know. Closed course, no TRICARE. No, um, getting a doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, um, Teresa Vey has experienced some doctors won't accept a patient if TRICARE is the primary payer. But they will accept it Medicare. We'll take TRICARE as a secondary. Right, that, that, is, that, is, that is the rule. But they will just, they'll always ask, is it TRICARE or Medicare, which is first? And it's like, I don't know, does it matter? And they're like, oh yeah, we won't yeah, take TRICARE matter. first. So, yeah. I think Medi Medicare is always going to be first, and TRICARE is always going to be going to be secondary, no matter how you look at it. That's the way they, that's the way it works. So I'm, okay. on it. I'm on it, so that's. that's okay. 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 So if you are not entitled to premium-free Medicare Part A, and you don't want to pay for it because it's too expensive. You do have the option just to enroll in Part B without paying for Part A if you're 65 and older. However, if you do decide to pay for Part A, you must also enroll in Part B. You cannot have A alone. So to some, if you are not entitled to premium free Medicare Part A, you can either have Part B or you can have A and B. You can't have A or B. So what Medicare Part A covers? Um, this covers things like inpatient hospital care, limiting home health, limited home health services, skilled nursing facility care, nursing home care, and hospice care. And I'm not going to go in too in depth to all of these since it was covered a bit yesterday, but I did want to talk about one in particular because this is probably the one we will run across the most. 
and that is skilled nursing facility coverage under Medicare Part A. So there are some pretty tricky rules about this. So in order for Medicare Part A to cover skilled nursing facility care, there has to be a qualifying hospital stay. The doctor must decide the person needs the care, so the doctor must order it or prescribe the care. The person receives the care in a Medicare certified facility and the nursing, and you need the nursing care for a condition that was treated or developed during the hospital stay. And the qualifying hospital stay is an inpatient stay for three full days or more. An outpatient time does not count. And so when I mentioned um, the condition has to be treated or developed during the hospital stay, that basically means there has to be a connection between why you ended up in the hospital or what developed while you were in the hospital and your need for nursing home care. So for an example, if you fell because you have mobility issues and then you ended up in the hospital, that would be a qualifying stay because you need nursing home coverage because of your fall. And that's the reason you ended up in the hospital for the first place. So there's a link and a connection there. But an example of what would not qualify is let's say you went to the hospital because you got poison ivy. And while you were there, they discover, oh, this person actually has dementia and needs to go to a nursing home. That would not count because the dementia is in no way related to why you came to the hospital for poison ivy, unless I guess you can make some attenuated argument that you had dementia and were wandering or something, and that's why you got poison ivy. But if they have nothing to do with each other, it can't just be you ended up in the hospital and, oh, it's conveniently, now we know you need nursing home care, so we're going to send you. That does not count. However, it could be that you go to the hospital because you got poison ivy. While you were there, you developed um, an infection like C. diff or something like that. And then you had to go to the ho a nursing home because of something that developed while you were staying in the hospital. And in my experience, um, hospitals are very knowledgeable about this three full day requirement because I've had a lot of senior clients go into the hospital for something and it's almost like the hospital knows when that three full day period has run and make sure they stay there the entire time so that they are eligible to go to the skilled nursing facility through Medicare. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. For dementia and elders, it tends to be they consider violent or, you know, mm -hmm. um, how you define it. Um, is that what I understand is happening is, and it's experience happening, is that the hospital will try, if they can't find a skilled nursing to take it, mm -hmm. then they'll try to get the family to take it. And then what happens is they fall to the bottom of the list of skilled nursing, lots of luck getting in. So, if you have somebody like that, keep them in the hospital because that pops into the top of the list and forces that case management right. to work hard. Right. Brain injuries and mm -hmm. dementia, they're swinging and they're considered violent and nobody wants them. Mm -hmm. And so just an FYI, I think she's right on most of that stuff. <coughs> they're mm -hmm. only in dementia patients. Keep right. them in the hospital because they're going to go to the bottom and they'll never look in that skilled nursing. Yeah. And so, um, here is the cost breakdown of what Medicare will cover for a stay in the skilled nursing facility. So for the first 20 days, there's not any cost to the Medicare enrollee. For days 21 to 100, it's 167 and 50 cents per day. And after day 101, um, the person is responsible for all the cost. So if you find your client in the nursing home and they're you know, somewhat in this um, below 100 days, this is a good time to start thinking about choices because once you start, once that 100 days hits, Medicare is not going to cover it at all. So this is the key time where you need to start planning for choices. Um, Danielle in her presentation touched on this a bit yesterday, but Medicare will not cover nursing home care if the only care the person needs is custodial care. So if that's, um, and this is things like bathing, dressing, feeding. If that's the only thing they need help with, Medicare is not going to cover it. It needs to be skilled. Um, 
Medicare Part A will also cover some part-time skilled nursing care and home health aid care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language services. Um, and this will be covered if the doctor orders it and you need one of these three, physical, speech, or OT, and you also have to be homebound. So Medicare Part B um, is just like your health insurance. So it will cover medically necessary services or supplies that are needed to diagnose or treat your medical condition and healthcare to prevent or detect illness at an early stage. And this includes ambulance services, durable medical equipment, mental health services, and you can also get a second opinion before surgery. And like anything else, like 10 care, certain criteria must be met in order for it to be covered. Um, Medicare.gov has a resource on their website in which you can find out if your test service um, item is covered. And I should note that as we talked about before, unless you are on QMB and all of your costs are going to be covered, you are still responsible for 20% of what Medicare does not cover. So um, I had a client that had um, Medicare Part B and her doctor had ordered a certain kind of wheelchair which would fit under durable medical equipment, but it was a very um, kind of advanced one like it needed to lift and lower so she could reach counters. And her 20% of the cost was actually very expensive and cost prohibitive for her. Okay, and that's it for me on part B. What can I ask? Is, is you may, the, yes. The payment, yeah, 20% of it, is that a, a fee? <coughs> you see, we've heard that Medicare sets or the provider sets? I think it's um, what the provider sets. What? Am I wrong on that? Medicare for every service has a fixed reimbursement rate. And if the doctor accepts Medicare, they have to accept that as payment in full. But however, like Emma said, Medicare is only gonna pay 80% of that for this expensive wheelchair and the patient's on the hook for the other 20%. But it's 20% of what Medicare says Yes. Okay, thank you. Can you negotiate a lower price so the provider says I don't pay the twenty percent, or does it have to pay that fee? I don't think so. I seriously doubt it. I've never heard of that. So they have to pay. Yeah. Okay. So if you think you're getting an expert on Medicare, think again. Um, the primary involvement that our program has had with Medicare is with the MSP program that Emma talked about. How many folks here have represented somebody with respect to MSP eligibility? Could re you raise your hand? Okay, all right, there's some. Just a little background. Um, about what happens and how these people are going to come into your office. They're not going to come into your office and say, I got turned down for the MSP program or I got cut off for the, the MSP program. What they're going to say is, I just got a letter from Social Security and my Social Security is usually $800 a month and this month it's only $400. What has happened is 10 care once a year reevaluates eligibility for the MSP program. How do they do that? Well, how would you do that with a group of seniors who have difficulty understanding um, long and complex forms? Well, you'd send them a 90 page packet. It would have 17 pages of questions. Some of the questions would be, what's the cash value of your life insurance policy? Is your burial policy revocable or irrevocable? Does anybody think seniors will have a problem with that? They do. Uh, many of our seniors swear to us that they never got the packet in the first place. We've never been able to establish that. The comptroller's office did investigations. 
but we have just had too many seniors who have said, I didn't get it, now some have forgotten. But what you have to do when that person comes in and all of a sudden their social security got cut in half is to try and appeal and also get a packet in. And um, we have, I, we sent out last year a protocol for handling these cases. We need to put it in the Dropbox for Tesla. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that today, but, but be aware if somebody comes into your office and all of a sudden their social security got cut in half, chances are excellent that they were on the MSP program, which was paying their Part B premiums. They got knocked off because they didn't send in a completed form. I had one client I represented who got knocked off because she didn't sign the form in the right place. Um, and um, take, take a look at that because my guess is that is gonna be the number one uh, time that you're going to be representing people with respect to their Medicare benefits. And especially if it's QMB, which not only pays the Part B, but also pays the deductibles and co-pays, that can be hundreds of dollars or even thousands of dollars every month. So it's extremely important for seniors. I saw some national data about four years ago that said that only 30% of eligible seniors we're participating in the program. So for our clients, anytime you see a client and they're having some money held, withheld for Part B premiums, OOGA, uh, the alarm should go off because the chances are excellent that they are eligible for the Medicare Savings Program. It goes all the way up to almost $1,400 a month for a, a single person. And we catch a lot of people who come to us for something else that are eligible for the Medicare Savings Program and, and don't know it. Hey, Russ. Um, and you can go online and, and do an application for them. Um, it, it's super easy. Um, it's, and, it, and there's paper forms, too, that you can do it online. Lots of times, my food stamp cases and screen have a name. It's like you said, in fact, not surprising to me that 30%, you know, because there's many of our clients aren't doing it. And that's a case, another case. And Amy's office is right across the street from a senior citizen's high rise. So Amy was one of the pioneers in doing this because they all streamed across the street with their little notices saying that their social security had gone from $800 a month to $400 a month. And, and since this happened a year ago, people don't understand what happened. And so there are tons of people that, that's been cut off that they're not gonna come and say that now because it happened so long ago and they can't remember, but all of your senior clients, and you, know, and you can call if you have them on the phone, or you have them in your office, you can call Tennessee Health Connect and have them um, on the phone with you and you can ask if they're getting the Medicare Savings Program. And if they're not, then fill out an application and fax it in or do it online and that's a case and you just got $134 a month. So it's so easy. So Medicare Part C, uh, a client will come to me and say, well, I don't have Medicare, I have HealthSpring. And I'll ask them, are you on Social Security? And if they say yes, well, they do have Medicare, but it's Medicare Part C, which is an alternative to the regular Medicare fee-for-service program. Regular Medicare, the doctor prescribes it, um, you're pretty much going to get it. Um, Part C, instead of having regular Medicare, you sign up for an Advantage plan. And I can attest from experience, when you're approaching 65, your mailbox is going to be very full because every Advantage company on the face of the earth, I think, is going to be sending you stuff about what a good deal it is. Um, 
Lots of them offer vision and dental, which are not offered through regular Medicare, which is a huge incentive for people. Um, one of our 10 care managed care organizations, when they were recruiting people, gave everybody who signed up a turkey at Christmas. I don't know if you can get a turkey from any of the Advantage companies, but it wouldn't surprise me. And Advantage plans are a mixed bag. Um, some of the advantages to an Advantage plan are people don't realize there's no out-of-pocket limit for the regular Medicare program. If you have $30,000 worth of outpatient costs, you got to pay that 20%. There's, there's no cap on that. Most of the Advantage plans do have an out-of-pocket limit. Um, most of the, a lot of the Advantage plans, like I said, um, will also cover things like health and dental that the regular Medicare program does not. The disadvantages are in most Advantage plans, you have a certain panel of providers. So before anyone chooses an Advantage plan, if they want to keep the doctors that they have, they need to check and make sure that those doctors are on the panel. I've also had more than one of my clients tell me they switched back to regular Medicare because of the difficulties they had getting approval for certain services and being told by providers, oh, if you were on regular Medicare, this, this, would, not, this would not be an issue. So there's, and I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, resources that are available to help people kind of wade through that. There's not a right answer between regular Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan, but, but people do need to be aware of the advantages and disadvantages of the program. So an Advantage plan may or may not charge a monthly premium. Um, it may or may not um, have a uh, yearly deductible, co-pays, limitations to network providers, and almost all of them do have an, a limit on your total out-of-pocket costs. So Advantage plans are supposed to cover all the services that the regular Medicare plan regular Medicare coverage. So at least in theory, there should not be a difference with respect to what services you can get other than the additional services that the Advantage plan may offer. One exception is hospice care is through the regular Medicare program. Um, something that clients may want to know is if they're on an Advantage plan, they can ask for a written advance coverage decision before they obligate themselves to an outpatient service where they're paying 20%. Uh, they can know whether uh, the Advantage plan is going to cover that or not. Most of the Advantage plans also cover uh, drug costs. We're going to talk in a little while about Part D of Medicare until, mm, I don't know, about 10 years ago, maybe 15, Medicare did not cover drug costs. Congress passed legislation to at least partially cover those drug costs, and most Advantage plans will also cover your, will also be insurance for your medication costs. So for an Advantage plan, the government just pays a fixed amount to um, the Advantage plan um, for each of the people that they enroll. Uh, for your care. And um, the Advantage plans, like I talked about, can say, do you have to see, do you have to have a referral for a specialist? Can you go to doctors uh, outside of the plan? And the rules about, in particular, what providers are in the plan can change uh, once a year.
So um, there's another kind of insurance plan called the Medigap pop plan. And that's where you remain on the regular Medicare program, but you want insurance that will cover those deductibles and co-pays. So if you've got regular Medicare and you have a Medigap policy, which again, are policies sold by private companies, they charge a premium um, at age 65 in Tennessee, you can expect that premium to be at least $250 a month for most of these plans, uh, but you'll then have seamless coverage. Um, so how do Medicare, uh, Medigap policies work with Advantage plans? They don't. Um, it's, you do one or the other, um, because if you've got a Medigap policy and then you, and then Health Springs persuades you that you should get a Medicare Advantage plan, that plan isn't going to be paying, um, the Medigap policy is not going to be paying your uh, Advantage costs, deductibles, co-pays, or premiums. And if somebody already has an Advantage plan, it's against the law for somebody to sell them a Medigap plan because they don't work together. You choose one, one or the other. So you've enrolled in an Advantage plan and all of a sudden your doctor is no longer on the plan. What do you do? Well, if it happens to be between October the 15th and December the 7th, you can pick another Advantage plan that has your doctor. If it happens to be between January 1 and February 14, you can go back to regular Medicare. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is if it happens to be February the 15th, uh, you got a long wait. Um, but um, for most of our clients, they will be able to switch at any time. And that's because there are some special circumstances that allow you to switch at any time. And the first of those is a program we're going to get to in Part D called Extra Help. It helps pay for your prescription drug costs, and you're eligible if your income's below 15, 17 a month. So lots of our clients are either on extra help or eligible for extra help. And they can get out of their Advantage plan and get into regular Medicare or get into a different Advantage plan at any time. You can also change within two months of losing uh, Medicaid 10 care eligibility. And there are, oh, about 15 other exceptions, some very narrow, other, others which are broader. Uh, the, the link is right there. Uh, I know you, I, I could never type that link, but I, I think, uh, is Tal's going to be saving a digital copy of these presentations? So you can go to Tal's and uh, have the digital copy, or if you really, really want your own right now, uh, if you email me, I'll send you a digital copy so you can uh, use the link to go through, well, what are all the special circumstances where my client can bail from the Advantage plan right now? So Medicare Part D, the prescription drug plans. This is a standalone in, well, there are, there are two ways you can get this. One is you buy an Advantage plan and, in, and it includes drug coverage. The other is you can buy a standalone prescription drug plan. There's going to be an additional premium for that uh, unless you're on TenCare or you're eligible for the extra help program. <laughs> Um, you can take a look at all the policies in your zip code by going to that link. And um, at the end of this PowerPoint, we've got resources. The SHIP program in Tennessee is a wonderful resource. 
it's free, it's run by volunteers, and they can help you make decisions about regular Medicare, Medigap, Advantage, Part D plans, and help you sign up and help you switch. Uh, it's staffed mainly by volunteers. Um, so someone who calls SHIP may not get a call back the same day, uh, but it is a free service. It's uh, run by the Tennessee Commission on Aging uh, and Disability, and it's a great place for people to go if they're shopping for uh, any of these plans. So um, how, how do you become eligible uh, for Part D? Well, you have to be on either Part A or Part B. You can't just buy Part, part D. And um, one exception to uh, having to pay a premium is if you're what's called dual eligible. Dual eligible means you have both tent care and Medicare. Typically, we see that where somebody um, has both Social Security and SSI. Their Social Security amount is low enough that they qualify for SSI, so they are dual eligible. Uh, and if a person is dual eligible, um, they will get their uh, medication costs paid automatically. So if you're not on TenCare, you need to sign up for Part D. And there are a couple of different ways to sign up for Part D. Again, you can contact SHIP for help applying you can do it online. And the nice thing about extra help and MSP is if you apply for one, you're evaluated for the other. So if you sign up for a SHIP via uh, the, uh, the online site, it will automatically be treated also as uh, an application for MSP. And we found in our office that that's one of the quickest ways uh, to do that, to have an application that will be treated both as an application for extra help and also an application for MSP. So we've talked about extra help. What is it? Um, hey, Russ, the, yes. The online one that you just talked about. Okay. Um, but there is to electronically yes, sign. Uh huh. Sign, they don't have to sign it, so uh -huh. it's a long time to do it with them on the phone. If you don't have to get them into the office, that's where the application that goes to Ten Care. You have to have them physically. Okay. <laughs> um. If you have somebody that is dual eligible, Medicaid may still cover some drugs that Medicare doesn't. Uh, it will also pay your premiums and co-pays. And the hierarchy of payment is Medicare is the primary insurer and Medicaid is the secondary insurer. Um, so the Medicaid program uh, may well pick up your 20% of um, outpatient costs, for example. The one thing you need to know about both Medicare and Medicaid is if a provider says, I'll accept Medicare, they can't bill you for more than the approved charge by Medicare. If a provider is a, med is, is a 10 care provider, they again cannot bill for more than the approved 10 care amount. They can't balance bill 
for another amount. Uh, they can't ask the client, well, I'll do this if you'll pay me a little bit extra. Well, they, they, would, they would get a, a visit from the federal authorities for doing something like that. Um, so um, if you see, especially dual eligibles, if you see them with any charges at all, alarm bells ought to be going off because unless it's a service that neither Medicare nor Medicaid cover, there shouldn't be any bill at all to that person. So uh, applying for extra help. Extra help, you can have an income of up to uh, $1,800 a year or roughly $1,500 a month and resources up to $14,000. So it's a higher income and resource limit than the Medicare savings program. And if you don't meet the limit right now, um, you, if your income or resources change, you, you can apply at a later time. So Part D enrollment typically it's within a seven a month period around your 65th birthday, just like Part B enrollment, or if you qualify because you're getting social security disability and you've now started to draw benefits, it's seven months around when you start to draw benefits. There is an open enrollment period for uh, Part B and changing uh, Part D and changing Part D. But again, if you're on the extra help program, you can, uh, you can uh, sign up at any time. There are also special enrollment periods for uh, some other criteria that are listed there. Unless you're on the extra help program, if you, sh you sign up for Part B later than the seven months after um, your 65th uh, uh, birthday, and like the Part B program, if you have private insurance that has medication coverage, you don't have to enroll, you won't incur a penalty for signing up for Part B uh, later. And again, it's the seven month period after you lose your private insurance. But uh, people that are eligible for extra help never have uh, a penalty period. So um, you, you have a bunch of choices about signing up either for an Advantage plan or a standalone drug plan. And um, the plans divide the drugs into, into tiers. And again, the SHIP program can help you do that. Medicare.gov, if you go there and they've got a button about find an insurance plan, they'll ask you what your zip code is and they can give you a list of all the Advantage plans, all the Medigap plans, and all the uh, Part D insurance plans that are in the area where you live. So Part D coverage will, will cover um, most medications. One big difference we've seen between TenCare and Medicare is the hepatitis C prescriptions, the new ones that can cost up to uh, $70,000 for a course of treatment. Medicare covers those. It's a pitched battle with TenCare. Um, they are over time liberalizing their eligibility, but it's much more difficult to get um, the new generation of hepatitis C drugs that are, some of them are 99% effective in eradicating the hepatitis C. But Medicare will cover those medications. That's, that's the big difference we see among our clients as to the drug coverage.
So some people don't know, a lot of our clients don't know if they're on Medicaid, they don't know if they're on TenCare, they don't know if they're on um, extra help. One way to ask a client uh, to, to, to get a ballpark idea about that is to say, do you have to pay more than $9 for a medication? If the answer to that is no, they're probably on extra help. Because if you look at this slide, the co-pays range from zero to $8.25. So if they're on extra help, it is really a very, very good deal. Um, but if they say that they are, um, if they are not on that pro, if they are paying more, then they probably don't have extra help and they need to sign up. Now, um, the extra help program has two tiers. The lower tier, below 135%, um, has those copays of no more than $8.25. The second tier, which is up to 150%, um, there, there can be uh, uh, higher charges and, and some copays. Has anybody here done a Medicare services appeal? Me either. Um, although we, we got our first one um, last week, but uh, people do have appeal rights, um, both with respect to regular Part A or B Medicare services, but also uh, if they have Part B insurance, an appeal right with respect to Part D. So there are some great resources for Medicare. Medicare.gov is really helpful with respect to uh, trying, if you want to go on your own to try and choose an Advantage plan or a um, Medigap plan or a Part D plan, the SHIP program is very helpful. Within the SHIP program, Shannon Jones is the director of the program. She's an attorney. She's a great resource if you're looking for an answer to a Medicare issue and you can't find it um, anyplace else. And I found her to be very responsive and very, very helpful. Then there are two uh, national organizations, the Medicare Rights Center and Justice in Aging, that both do a lot of Medicare work. Um, Medicare Rights has a website that has training sessions for you, has all kinds of resource materials about information with respect to Medicare. Justice in Aging also provides periodic Medicare training. Um, they also are a resource for you to contact. We contacted them about the MSP issue uh, and they were helpful with respect to that. And they also do litigation on behalf of Medicare recipients. So that's, um, that's the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? I might say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and and the nice thing is if I'm that if they're on extra help in theory at least, I don't see any reason they can hop on, get their dental coverage, and then hop off. Do you know what kind of coverage it is? Is it everything they have? I have no idea. And I think it varies, it varies from one Advantage plan to another. You would have to look at the, the Advantage plan to find out exactly what they would cover, what the deductibles are, co-pays, all of that kind of thing. Shannon, be a good well, the, the best, 
Shannon's not going to know off the top of her head which I think the best thing it would be to go to medicare.gov and say I want to look at uh, advantage plans and then they will have a link to the actual company that ought to be able to explain to you exactly what is our dental coverage. But that's, I hadn't thought about that. That's a good idea. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you.